Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this second plenary session of the 22nd World ITS Congress. I'm Melinda Crane, and it is a great pleasure to be back in the ITS community. Our subject this afternoon is space for intelligent mobility, but we're going to begin with the stars, terrestrial stars, that is as in the winners of our Hall of Fame Industry Award. It recognizes outstanding achievement by industry in connection with ITS. And I'd like to ask our award presenters to please now join me on the stage. The lead presenter will be Jill Ingracia from ITS America Board of Directors from the US. And I'd like to also ask uh, Mr. Hajimo Amano, who is President and CEO of ITS Japan, and Didier Gotaman, who is CEO, CFO and Director of Congresses for Ertico, to join Jill as well. So, Jill, tell us what's in store. All right, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here. I know that a lot of you got caught in a little bit of rain. I have to apologize to ITS International, because on my way over, I had to use my copy of today's um, daily show. Uh, as my umbrella, so I know everybody got a little wet. Um, so I'm honored to announce the 2015 winners of the Industry Hall of Fame Awards uh, on behalf of our three regions. So the industry award that's going to be um, given today is um, to a company or research organization, as you can see here on the slide, that developed uh, and or deployed a significant new innovative product or service over the course of the previous year whose new product or service played a key role in accelerating development and deployment of ITS in the region, and is a company or research organization that plays a leading role in the ITS community. So um, you may be familiar with the uh, awardees from previous years, shown here on the screen. And without further ado, I know you're all anxious to know who the winners of this year's awards are. For the first award from Europe, is here. Mr. Aki Redzik, Senior Vice President, Connected Driving, is here to join us and accept the award. Congratulations. <laughs> would you like to say a few words before we present the award to you? I would love to. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody in the audience. On behalf of more than 6,000 employees of here, I'm delighted to receive this award. Uh, as you may know, as uh, in previous incarnations as uh, Navigation Technologies and Navtech, we have been part of the ITS community for 20 plus years, since the very first World Congress. Our employees have dedicated their lives and their careers to making the best possible maps, best possible location services, best possible traffic services. And as we look forward to the next 20, 30 plus years of ITS, we expect to be integral part of it like we have been today. And I once again want to thank ITS America, ITS Japan, and Ertico for this award. Thank you. Do we have, yes. do we have photos? Yeah. Okay. And Okay, so next from Asia Pacific, the recipient of the award is Far Eastern Electric Toll Collection from Chinese Taipei. Mr. Zhang Qin Shen, the Vice Minister of the Ministry of Economic Affairs, is here, and joining him is Mr. Douglas Tong Su, Chairman and CEO of Far Eastern Group, Chinese Taipei. Please welcome them to, uh, the, sto to the stage to receive the award. And if you'd like to make a couple of remarks, thank you. please, sure. Good afternoon. It is uh, with 
most humbleness and great honor to receive this ITS award. I am privileged to have the Deputy Minister of Economic Affairs also join Far Eastern Electronic Toll Collection Systems Company that he came to also witness our receiving the award. It has been on and off probably between eight to 10 years before the system come into so-called completion. And we like to say with all humbleness that the toll collection system in the world, perhaps for the first time, see a system that is operated 24 hours a day with no hands, no legs, no arms. It is totally uh, automated. The collection goes to the government and the system works on. Um, we have holidays, we also adjust the rates. And uh, because of the accuracy we claim, and which is witnessed, 99.99 accuracy. And uh, because of the convenience, it is now practically about 94% uh, being utilized. And uh, the utilization rate will continue to rise. And out of whole Taiwan, we hope after uh, coming to ITS to receive this award, it will invigorate uh, all those who are involved in IT as that uh, the future is all in our hands and it will move much, much faster uh, for this system. I ask uh, Deputy Minister of uh, Economic Affairs, uh, he came and participated and also saw uh, today the show and everything. He's also very moved and I think from all governmental side, uh, the government's assistance in helping is in, cannot be beat. So I will have the Deputy uh, Minister say a few words. Is it okay? So he's, again, Chinese officials are humble. So, <laughs> so we thank everyone. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. So for our final award, it goes to the Americas, and it is for a collaborative um, project between two companies. The recipients are Qualcomm, Qualcomm Technologies, Inc. and Honda R&D Americas. To uh, receive these, this award is Ms. Sue Bai, Principal Engineer at Honda, and Jim Meisner, Technical, Director of Technical Standards at Qualcomm. They're here, so congratulations. Well, on behalf of my wonderful colleagues at Honda, I truly feel honored to receive such a pre prestigious recognition. Uh, well, my PR team wrote something, but I'll shorten it. Leave some time for Jim. Uh, this is, uh, we didn't make the journey alone. This is a genuine collaboration through very different companies um, trying to make a difference in the vulnerable uh, road user protection. And the V2P DSRC research is we truly believe this is a big step towards a safety for everyone and a collision-free society that Han always dreams. Again, thank you. On behalf of the research team, our corporate R&D research team, and on behalf and with great pleasure working with Honda 
as Sue mentioned, a completely different company with a common goal is to save lives, to invent, and to, to provide this community and pedestrians with, with safety in their hands is, is quite an honor, and, and thank you very much. Congratulations to all the award recipients, and thank you all for being here. Back to you. Thank you very much, Julian Gracia, and indeed many, many congratulations to all of the award winners, and many thanks uh, to all three of the award presenters. So now, let's go to space. As you know, innovative technologies are driving a profound transformation in the transport sector. It's on display over in the exhibition halls. You've been talking about it here since the beginning of the week. Of course, all of us have, are aware of the way that terrestrial developments, big data and mobile, for example, are changing our lives. But many of us are somewhat less of the, aware of the future potential that space applications hold. That's because space industry has traditionally tended to focus on a niche market, on defense and government projects. So exploitation of space technologies for commercial uses has been confined to just a few areas, although some of them, of course, are highly visible. Take global navigation satellite systems, GNSS. They are a great example of what can happen when a technology that initially targeted military applications does manage to find its way into civilian uses. 14% of global satellite communication revenues are already being generated by transport uses, and that share is expected to double in the next five years. So satellite navigation holds great promise, clearly, but so do other space technologies, such as communications and Earth observation. Just how they can augment ter terrestrial technologies to reduce infrastructure costs, to enhance passenger experience and safety, and to promote sustainability is our subject for the next hour and a half. What opportunities do space technologies offer and create for consumers, for network operators, and for service providers? And how can they deploy them effectively and cost effectively. We begin with a keynote and we'll then delve deeper with a high-ranking international panel. It's my pleasure now to hand over the stage to the Director of Investments at the French Caisse de Depot Group. She's a, it is a public investor whose roots go back nearly 200 years, but the Caisse de Depot is in fact looking firmly to the future. It recently set up a new window to invest in projects and innovative technologies that, uh, and also to foster companies that promote innovation. Madame Gabrielle Gauthier joined the Caisse de Depot at the beginning of this year after serving as Group Corporate Vice President in charge of global public affairs and governmental projects for Alcatel Lucent. She also was General Secretary of the Invest in France Agency and has been Deputy CEO of Sofirat and CEO of LISAT. We're very interested to hear how new technologies on Earth and in space are changing what Caisse de Depot can offer in terms of services. The floor is yours. Oh. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction. Yes, I, uh, let me say a few words of why is an old lady like uh, the Caisse de Poor speaking in front of this distinguished industrial audience. Uh, I must confess I have uh, um, uh, a little experience of satellite as I built the first French satellite bouquet to Africa. And I can tell you that satellite has a great future with, uh, to, together with ICT. So that's for, for, that's for sure. But today I'm going to tell you what is needed and um, to, um, to combine uh, this uh, rather classical 
um, sector, that is transport, with new technologies to, uh, and how this sector is about to experience a very disruptive um, revolution, um, uh, as many other sectors due to and thanks to um, digital, and satellite has all its part in the digital revolution. Just a few words of why we're here. The, the French Caisse des Dépôts is an old, as was said, an old institution going back 200 years ago. We're going to celebrate our 200th anniversary. And it's fulfilling, um, it's a public entity, but has subsidiaries, Transdev and Aegis, in the transport sector are subsidiaries of the French Caisse des Dépôts. Um, it's a group fulfilling public missions in support of public policies um, and um, particularly focused, our mission is to be particularly focused in, um, uh, in easing transitions and looking towards the future and building, um, trying to scale projects, innovative projects, um, when, we can, when we can be there. So, we try and ease transitions in various fields, territorial transitions, demographic transitions, digital and ecological transitions. And of course, um, we're very much involved in smart cities, trying to, um, to build smart cities, uh, mainly in France, but also um, uh, together with uh, some industries around the world. And this was part of my mission when I was with Alcatel Lucent. Smart cities are emerging all around the world. And transport is particularly, as I was said, a big part uh, of these smart cities. Now, we are, you are about, and, and your sector um, is about to be, as I said, totally to, facing two major disruptions. The first one, yes, is after... Um, is the digital transition. After, we must say, a few decades of fairly linear development of transport and infrastructure and, uh, and transport operators, uh, this is going to disrupt in, in many ways uh, the old economy of transport. Um, how? Of course, the, as was said, the mobile data explosion uh, and the great need for infrastructures. I don't know if, he, if you realize that the smartphone is the innovation in, um, in, in, the, in the history of mankind that has had the most rapid penetration. And this is not going to leave transport um, unchanged. It took 18 months to reach the same penetration that it took uh, in, uh, when the same penetration, it took 15 years to, um, to uh, TV, color TV. So that just gives you... Um, and we anticipate that in the five coming years, the traffic that is going to need to, to... The infrastructures are going to be upgraded because the traffic is going to be multiplied by a factor of 35 due to sensors, captors, internet of things. There's not going to be one single object that is not going to be connected to the internet. Um, second, of course, is the rise of GPS, global positioning systems. And that's a great, uh, that's where the space in, in, in industry comes in. It's uh, due to, the, um, to its reach, due to its resiliency, um, GPS is going to be uh, part of this revolution of transport systems. Um, digitalization of maps, of course, and everything around big data through traffic information, traffic patterns. The second disruption is the um, energy and ecology transition. There's a great and an urgent need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there is an increased um, sensitiveness uh, all around the world um, to traffic and air pollution. How do you combine this with the growing and uh, urbanization? Now, this is a challenge for transport. The rise of alternative fuel technologies, electric, gas, hydrogen, and then, of course, the, the need, the urgent need for alternative systems to allow low emission transportation, and the, the great topic of the last mile. I'm going to try and give you a few examples of um, smart mobility projects that we are exploring with the intent to find business models and then scale them. Because the emerging, um, I mean, transport and mobility is not just a matter of uh, industry and technology. And I can, I can tell you, I come from the ICT technology. The, there are so many projects that are beautiful and so many technologies uh, that exist that do not come through because 
they have not been able to find the business models and they have not been able to put around the table the public and the private um, and the right consortiums and find the right business models. And that's what we do, the glue between the public and the private, and we invest and uh, early on in engineering process, in studies, to make the beautiful, um, uh, most beautiful projects come through and exist. So I'm going to try and, and illustrate a few ideas of how digitals allow to think differently uh, in the transport industry, and how it's going to disrupt traditional mobility and how it can help with the great and be um, uh, a trade-off to increase uh, instead of the increase of traditional investments. I mean, just in the Paris area, uh, in the next 10 years, there will be an additional demand of 23% for rail transport um, when the traditional offer can only be 9%. How do we deal with that? We have to deal with technology and with the change of behaviors. And that's when some of, this, of these new projects come, come through. The first one is all the services that are going to be built on mobility data, um, with the purpose to improve services to citizens and users, to improve quality of life, to improve city operations, um, and to develop externalities to reach more economic development, city local attractiveness, cooperation with the public actors. Now, the data production, as I said, is going to be huge. Production of data through public data, public data coming from private actors, private data that are going to be collected, processed, and broadcasted. And we anticipate, we try and anticipate what kind of new services and how, through which consortiums, so we have a few, um, a few cities under, under monitoring with the consortiums of public and private uh, actors uh, that we're following and, and financing. Um, and the purpose is to create new innovative services for passengers, intermodal uh, routes. Um, to, and there you need to make the public and the, and the private uh, work together. Um, the, I think the, that, that's what, one, of the, one example, but we have to be very modest. Um, because some very new innovative services are going to be managed by the teenagers today, and we don't can even think of them. Um, and the time is not very far where we can you can relax while reading your morning news um, in an automatic electric car, uh, using managed lanes that, that will be that will drop you in front of your office and go and self park. So that's that's in a rather uh, rather near future. And the fact is that all the individual technology building blocks that I described are there for this. But you need, they need to be properly integrated through software and then scaled through intelligent business models. Of course, the, the second application smart for smart mobility is the alternative um, transport systems through carpooling. And there we, and, um, we are engaged in various consortiums because it, it's not... The, the carpooling and the, the, it's not just blah blah car that you must have heard of, which is the, uh, the French star right now. Um, and the GAFAs are not going to be the only ones uh, building these models. So we can, the expectation is to develop carpooling through suburban and ru even rural areas or in, in a special county or, 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 or city and to co-create that with local authorities and actors and, and enterprises that are present uh, in an area uh, and that can interoperate. And we have such um, consortiums um, for the moment under that we finance. One of them is in the southeast, southwest of Paris with companies such as Cisco, NG, Buick Construction that build offices to, um, that are a combination of traffic um, uh, monitoring um, or of um, intermodal services for, for uh, consumers and um, of telecenters, I will speak that, um, to, to push people to move uh, and shift they, they, uh, their behaviors. Now, this moved me to the positive toll or time-shifting mobility. Um, instead of, in order to, be, to avoid getting stuck in traffic jams, there is uh, another way than making people pay. It's to instead of making them pay to have access, it's, um, it's to 
to make them pay either pay less taxes or even earn some money for accepting not to use the car during rush hours. Now, this is a little bit uh, stunning, but uh, we have, with our subsidiary, uh, Aegis, some good examples of, um, of such, um, such projects where people can, uh, especially in the, uh, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, uh, where people have accepted or are incentivized to change their behaviors um, through new business models that we, are, we have found. Uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam have spent on this project a few, already a few billion euros, and it seems to work. And of course, you have to build a consortium with the insurance companies, with the technology um, industry, with the local actors, and that's uh, where we come in. Now, of course, one other example is to change totally your behavior also, and to go and, space in, and work in co-working spaces, tele centers, non-mobility. Um, due to the home office, a lot of the traffic is due to home office, so foster either tele-home working or, um, or um, we have invested in tele-centers that are now um, rapidly spreading uh, over the country, and also we're thinking of investing in an Airbnb for offices, uh, for instance. Now, these are other, other examples. Now, how how can that be made possible and how can these little experiences scale? Uh, in a world, I think, in, of drastic budgetary public constraints, uh, where local well, states are a, a lot thinking of reducing the, both the investment and the, and the capex, and where you see that it's um, uh, complex investments combining both traditional infrastructure and transport with smart digital systems, both hardware and software. That's where we think that smart PPPs for smart mobility come, come in. Um, that leave the public sector, the organizer of, of mobility on a territory, a central role to organize more time efficient, cost efficient, environmental friendly mobility for citizens. But we believe that a combination of high-performing contractors and technology providers, together with professional investors and with the, um, the authority organizing, can lead the way to propose states or local authorities cost-efficient, sustainable, smart PPPs. Smart mobility requires to upgrade existing infrastructure with digital hardware, traffic sensors, camera, GPS tracking, and through software that will bring mobility solutions to the palm of the user's hand. Now, these projects are very often too complex and not compatible with a sliced, siloed public procurement process. That's why we think the fine, and there's another financial factor, is the cost of capital in the private sector has recently reached historical lows for both debt and equity, thanks to quantitative easing programs. It therefore can make sense for public sector to seek to lock in such favorable financial conditions in the lifetime of a PPP rather than carry and refinance and risk over the midterm. Financial and operational risk allocation can be much better balanced and made explicit between the public sector and the private contractors, equipment providers, through public-private partnerships by wrapping the overall procurement process into a single contract. That's in our DNA, the public linking the public and the private and building, looking to the future, new innovative models. So that's why we think um, that uh, we are open to uh, looking a lot of what's happening around the world, uh, although we are a very French-rooted um, institution. But we're open to new innovative thinking, to explore new innovative models. We've done that uh, already 12, 12, 12, 20 years, 200 years, sorry. And we think these models in the transport sector are urgently needed urgently needed because of the explosion of the mobility needs, the growing urbanizations, all these smart cities that we talk of, um, but also because of the ecological and climate change obligations. So these innovative models are made possible thanks to the digital revolution. That's one thing. But thanks to other new innovative models and a change also of behaviors. And to be very modest, I must tell you that sometimes I, uh, they will rely uh, also on the imagination of the digital natives, which are the, young, uh, the youngers uh, of our generation. And we are very much turned towards also this demographic, um, this demographic uh, transition, trying to, 
to foster new innovative models and embracing all these transitions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Gabriel Gauthier for that look at Caisse des Depots and uh, its focus on how technology is changing transport and mobility. We'd now like to take a closer look at some of the technologies that are driving those changes, uh, and particularly focusing on the way that space technologies might augment terrestrial ones in order to deliver the kind of benefits we've just heard about. So may I please ask our panelists to now join me here on the stage, and I will then introduce them. So a very warm welcome to our four international panelists, and I will start with my introductions here uh, with the gentleman to my uh, immediate right. He is Mr. Antti Padomaki, and he is Deputy Director General at the European Commission Directorate for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, and SMEs, fondly known as DG Growth. He previously served as Deputy Director General in the Information Society and Media Directorate, and prior to joining the Commission in 2006, he held leading posts in the office of the Prime Minister of Finland. Great that you can be with us, Mr. Peltomäki. And seated next to him, it's a pleasure to welcome Mr. David Combi. He is French Interministerial Coordinator for the European GNSS programs, those satellite navigation programs I mentioned earlier, uh, CNES, M-E-D-D-E, -D -D -E, or perhaps it's MEDI. Uh, I forgot to check with you how I should pronounce it. He devoted much of his career to air navigation safety, for example, as Chief of Department at the French Ministry for Ecology, Sustainable Development, and Energy, where he was responsible for the safety safety and performance of the French air navigation service provider, DSNA. A warm welcome. <laughs> and seated next to him, we're very glad to have with us Mr. Zhao Jing Wang. He is chief engineer at the Chinese Ministry of Transport's Research Institute on Highways, and he also heads China's National ITS Center, as well as its ITS Industry Alliance. As vice chairman of ITS China, Professor Wang has presided over major ITS development projects, and he serves as chief expert of the National Electronic Toll Collection Project. The ITS World Congress 2012 appointed him to the World ITS Hall of Fame. Great to have you with us, Mr. Wang. And finally, I'm very glad to welcome Mr. Ogi Redzik. He is Senior Vice President uh, Automotive at the Mapping and Location Provider HERE, which is headquartered in Germany. And as you know, HERE was one of this year's uh, Hall of Fame Award, Industry Award winners. Uh, so special honor to have you there. He leads the development of all automotive activities for HERE, from developing solutions to manage traffic congestion to embedded navigation systems and automated driving. So, warm welcome, finally, to Mr. Reitzig. We will begin with a short presentation by each panelist, then I might ask a, a follow-up question or two, and uh, then we will try to make some time for open discussion with the floor as well. Deputy Je Director General, I would like to begin with you uh, and ask you to tell us, please, how the European space programs can contribute to intelligent transport. And please do use the lectern. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Bordeaux and in especially kind of ITS uh, World Congress whenever it's addressing the kind of uh, issues uh, in relation uh, to space. Uh, as for we in the uh, Director General uh, for Growth or Internal Market Industry uh, Entrepreneurs and SMEs, also responsible for space research as well as, as then uh, space projects on the European uh, Union. And uh, of course, I think that we are in a way, also I think on the other end, uh, uh, in, in relation to uh, intelligent uh, transport systems, whenever we are responsible for the automotive uh, industry in, in Europe, and of course I think the kind of a regulatory framework that this is really related to the uh, vehicles themselves. 
but definitely we are not in, uh, responsible for transport as such. And of course there are colleagues, uh, for, uh, I think that the DG MOVE, who are very much, I think, collaborating whenever we are thinking of ITS solutions, as well as uh, my former colleagues in DG Connect, who are really the experts on the ICT. But altogether, I think that we are happy really to uh, try to figure out what kind of, uh, let's say, satellite-based technologies can provide for the ITS in today's world, and I think perhaps I think that even further uh, down the kind of a line, whenever we are looking kind of what are the future uh, prospects for that. But by developing the kind of a new generation of the global navigation uh, uh, satellite systems, I think that we in Europe have uh, very much based on uh, civilian older kind of systems, and uh, I think that we have been laying down foundations for new high tech uh, industry development. We hope that I think that this really start to uh, show up. And I think that we are having separate kind of uh, projects, Galileo, which is I think our global navigation system, which is going to be deployed. I think we are having now 10 satellites up in the orbit. And I think that, that, that we are having also the ECNOS, which is a EU uh, GPS uh, augmentation system, which is up and running and already providing services to different type of the kind of a transport uh, uh, domains. And these systems are the key contributors for a global and continuous and guaranteed timing and positioning service. And I guess that in this context, we should not forget that we are also having kind of a Copernicus, which is a kind of a Earth observation satellite, which is already up and running. And I think that it's providing uh, accurate data about environment, air, land, weather conditions, and can be used for different type of the weather forecasting and air quality monitoring. And uh, of course, it has also been used uh, uh, that the Copernicus data that is available today in transport planning phase. And I think we are really looking at how we start uh, in, let's say, commercial scale kind of a services. And I think that the Copernicus is already, I think that the kind of a very close to the kind of a market applications and services in place. And through these two programs, <coughs> we are already designing and enabling uh, secure, safe, and accessible services for transport users in all modes of uh, transport, being the road, rail, maritime, or aviation. And along uh, with the delivering economic benefits, the navigation uh, satellites devices, which are integrated also to the uh, all different kind of vehicles today, have changed how we manage the mobility, safety and security of the people that are, I think, that really our main concern. And we are moving towards more uh, and more automation in transport. We are calling it connected and automated uh, uh, transportation or mobility. And this is where we really believe that ECNOS and Galileo can make a significant contribution for the future. I guess that this is the four minutes for me now, and I'm happy to continue by discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peltomeki. So as you say, uh, Europe is looking quite optimistically toward further developments, uh, both with regard to Galileo and to Copernicus. Do I take that to mean that while we're already seeing some benefit across a multitude of industry sectors, including transport, there are much greater gains to be expected in future? I think that, uh, already today I was uh, mentioning that where we are in terms of uh, our Copernicus uh, satellites so that they are providing a huge amount of data and I think now there is a kind of a all different kind of uh, uh, projects ongoing and I think that how to make sure that I think that this kind of uh, which is basically public data that uh, how it can be used in different kind of a commercial uh, kind of applications and how you can really build up for a new type of uh, the business layers and I guess that it's part of the bigger uh, big data business but of course I think we have been identifying also I think that, that how it can be used in different kind of uh, let's say uh, intelligent uh, transport uh, systems and I guess that uh, what we have uh, seen today is only only very early on kind of applications that are available of course uh, I guess that we are having much better uh, qualified colleagues to tell what they can do today and in terms of uh, different kind of uh, transport sectors. But I guess that uh, 
we are definitely sure that I think that uh, the whole of the digitalization, as we were listening uh, Gabriel's presentation, is, is very much giving the impression what is going to happen in different parts of our, kind of our economic activities and how different kind of our IT devices, including the space uh, technologies, can provide. And I guess that this is very disruptive, but in a positive sense. Thank you very much for that. Well, Europe has, in fact, long dreamed of having its own fully operational uh, satellite navigation system, and it did come a step closer to that uh, just recently with last month's deployment of several new satellites. So perhaps uh, David Combe will tell us a bit more about where things stand now and what's in store. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of Mr. Jean-Yves Le Gall, uh, the president of the French Space Agency and the interministerial coordinator for the GNSS program, I'm very pleased to uh, present uh, a point of view of the French authorities on the use of the GNSS for uh, ITS applications. So I think the clear, I hope it will work. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> Shall we see if we can get some technical? There we go. Looks like things are. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. Um, so first, um, as Mr. Peltomaki from the European Commission said, clearly Galileo is becoming a reality for the European citizens. Initial services are expected in 2016 with more than 12 satellites. Final operational capability in 2020 with around 30 satellites. Uh, there is a, uh, another program also which is important for Europe, uh, which was first operational in uh, 2011, EGNOS. Uh, it's important to note a uh, major evolution of EGNOS as of 2021, with improved performance based on dual frequency, multi-constellation. As of 2021, EGNOS will have the capability to augment both GPS and Galileo. Uh, so we, we note that the European GNSS is not only becoming a reality, but um, uh, uh, is a step towards a new generation of GNSS. And all that on the basis of uh, that statement, I can, we can easily state that new services should emerge in several domains such as civil aviation. So civil aviation is a pioneer community uh, as to uh, the use of the GNSS. But uh, the maritime uh, community is also a user of GNSS. The rail tomorrow uh, may be a, a very important user leading to strong um, economy uh, in terms of um, uh, conventional infrastructure operating costs uh, and the road obviously with new services another aspect also dealing with GNSS is the fact that GNSS provides a very accurate time and it will have a strong role to play on the network synchronization Um, I think it's also interesting to note some differentiators of the European GNSS. First, a better resistance in the constrained environment thanks to uh, the structure of the Galileo signals. Another aspect is that uh, in the frame of the commercial service of Galileo, high precision uh, will be available and also uh, the authentication uh, of the signal leading to uh, liability uh, applications. And the combination of Galileo and EGNOS as of 2021 will improve the, the accuracy and the integrity of the GNSS. And there is an aspect also which is not so often mentioned, but which is important for the French uh, authorities, is that Galileo will be fully and strongly interoperable with GPS. Uh, there is no way in the future to uh, think about a single constellation of GNSS. So uh, it will be really uh, beneficial for the users to, um, to benefit from this inter 
interoperability. But leading with ITS insofar as um, when you are in a vehicle, for instance, you are not below an open sky all the time. You have to uh, cross tunnels and very constrained environment. Uh, it's necessary to think about the complementarity uh, between GNSS and other sensors, such as cameras, such as radars, inertial systems, odometer, and, and so on. Uh, and we have in mind the ultimate target of autonomous vehicles. And thinking about the way to use uh, GNSS and other sensors um, should lead to um, standardization activities. This will be a strong challenge for the coming years. So as a conclusion, I think it's important to note first the advent of the European GNSS programs um, that will be combined with other technologies uh, this is really an opportunity to seize for the benefit of the European citizens and beyond. Uh, this is a World Congress and through uh, new ambitious ITS applications. Thank you very much. Many thanks to you, David Combi. So looking ahead, would you say that your focus in coming years is going to be more on generating new technologies, on generating new applications? You wrote uh, at the end of your presentation about uh, ambitious new ITS applications. Or will it be on bringing costs down in order to ensure that the benefits, in fact, do become widely available on the market? Actually, I think it depends on the domain of applications. Um, looking at the road transportation, well, clearly, uh, I mentioned uh, the autonomous vehicles. This will be, in uh, mid-term future, a reality. Uh, so this will be a new, a new service, actually. But if you look, for instance, at the rail domain, clearly, um, we believe in France that it's really worth studying the way to use GNSS so as to, um, to optimize the conventional uh, infrastructure, uh, the conventional signaling infrastructure that, would, that may lead at the European scale to hundreds of millions of uh, cost benefits per year. So I would say that it depends on the domain. Thank you very much. Indeed, we often tend to focus on the connection between ITS and vehicles and perhaps not look enough at the benefits for fixed infrastructure. So many thanks for that reminder. Let me move on now to the Asia Pacific region and ask Mr. Zhao Jing Wang to give us his view. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think the this time no, we are discussed uh, how could you use the space technology to improve the road management and the transportation management. So uh, I think that I'll give you some uh, uh, example in uh, some uh, opinion uh, in Chinese uh, side. Uh, you know, China is a big country. We have a huge uh, population. Uh, now we have a very big uh, expressway network uh, up, uh, to the end of last year with more than uh, 100,000 uh, 100, uh, kilometers expressway. Uh, this uh, huge uh, net, uh, road network, expressway network, how can the management, how to get information of the transportation? And also you can see uh, we have a, uh, a huge uh, network and um, a huge transportation quantity. Uh, you can see uh, we uh, transportation affect all aspects of China, a huge transportation quantity. Every day, every people, they use this uh, transportation network. So how can the management, how the improve the efficiency uh, and uh, improve the safety? 
So I think the G, uh, gene as the space technology is uh, very important. Okay, to give us some example. Uh, in every day, you get a huge uh, local-based uh, uh, service uh, in China. I'll give the example. Every day, the five billion location request every day in the Tencent system. Tencent is a, a net a internet work company. We have another internet uh, company, and the Baidu, uh, Tencent, uh, Ali, and, and so on. So this uh, uh, that we can get from the, uh, the GNSS, uh, GPS, and the Chinese uh, uh, satellite system, uh, BDS. We can use uh, this uh, that can calculation, uh, discovery, uh, guidance, uh, control, the traffic and the transportation. And also we can use the information to serve, uh, provide the information to the user uh, generated the content uh, shared by the uh, participant and the uh, real time traffic information and so on. And also, we can use uh, this uh, uh, that from the uh, GPS, uh, GNSS, uh, DBS, and uh, integrate with the other uh, source of the information to calculate the transportation. Uh, model, uh, transmission pattern, uh, give the, some the, uh, decision support to the government. Uh, this uh, example, this picture is an example for the, uh, during the fifth of spring, is a traditional Chinese uh, holiday. You can see every province the people moved. And uh, see the hard part of the airport and uh, their uh, travel distance. All this is based on the smartphone, uh, navigators, uh, your tickets, the, uh, that, and so on, the integrate, uh, can calculate this, uh, this, uh, this uh, result. I, I think this is very useful for the, the government, for the operators, for the company, to can use this. And also, another example, very uh, good example, is uh, uh, network reservation taxi service based on the mobile internet and the GNSS. In China, we have a very big company, the Didi and the Kuaidi. Uh, this uh, company covered more, uh, more than uh, 300 cities. The people can use uh, the, the, this APP to book your taxi, book the, uh, your car, and the share in the car, and very useful. Every day, more than, uh, more than uh, 10 million uh, requests of a reservation using this system. And also, the Uber entered China in the last year. It's uh, covered uh, 14 cities. And also, how can they use the GNSS technology to improve uh, the future transportation? Uh, Chinese government have uh, designed some uh, policy and uh, want to use the uh, market-driven uh, this uh, market. Uh, the first one is uh, accelerated application of Chinese uh, satellite positioning technology. It's a Beidou navigation satellite system. It's a, we call it BDS. It's the Chinese technology. Now they covered the uh, China and uh, east of the Asia. And in the near future, maybe cover the total Asia. And also use this uh, the technology we can uh, uh, compatible with the GPS and other satellites. And intercity passenger bus and the freight vehicle must instead install the monitoring equipment based on the BDS. It's the uh, government the policy. Another important thing is uh, cybersecurity and the privacy protection. I think this is very important because you use the GNSS technique to get information from the root, the personal position, and so on. So cybersecurity and the privacy protection is very important. And also, we want to use the uh, market-driven this uh, business. 
uh, we were in, encourage the enterprise play uh, a very important uh, role and uh, uh, invest them to even more investment, increasing the new uh, business uh, models and also encourage the competition in the service market. This is the, a brief introduction about uh, satellite use, the technology used uh, in China. I think this uh, is a big market in the space technology to improve the measurement, the improve the safety, improve the transportation, and uh, give the people the community in their life and a good, a good life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zhe Jing Wang. So as you mentioned at the outset of your presentation, China does face tremendous challenges because of its vast size, both geographically but especially uh, in terms of population when it comes to transport and logistics. Where do you see the biggest added value of space technologies in helping you master those challenges? Uh, you know, uh China is a huge population. How can they get the information, get the more data to make the decision? We want to know the exactly uh, situation, the true uh, situation. But I think the space technology is very important. It's very useful for this because we have a huge uh, country, especially in the west of China, it's uh, just, a, just a beginning development. The communication uh, infrastructure and other uh, things is, uh, is uh, just a big, just with the develop. But the space technology is very few because he's in, in the space. In, we can uh, see everything from the space to the uh, to the land, the road, the transportation, uh, vehicle, and so on. So I think it's a very important thing. So some leapfrogging uh, benefits there for areas where terrestrial perhaps is not yet uh, extensively developed. Many thanks for that. So finally, let us now hear from Ogi Retzik uh, from here in regard to future developments that will affect your services. Thank you, Melinda. So uh, most of you know here and you wonder why are we talking in this panel on space technologies and I will tell you the very existence of our company is really due to developments in space. If there was no GPS, we as a company would not exist today. Uh, two or three weeks ago at uh, EIA, which is a big Frankfurt Motor Show, we were part of more than 90% of new vehicles that were launched with our maps and location services. So obviously none of that would be happening. Navigation as we know it today would not exist without GPS. So we are very indirectly benefiting from, from space technology and any improvement in positioning is an improvement that helps us in our product portfolio. The second and maybe not so obvious uh, uh, use of space technology for us is absolutely satellite imagery because uh, when you go to far places uh, where there isn't a whole lot of human activity, and there is a new construction, new projects, uh, there's uh, mudslides taking the roads off. The satellite imagery that's fresh is often used for us to detect that change before we send uh, people to, to update our maps. And as such, uh, we continue to monitor the progress in, in space technology. Also, uh, I will spend the rest of my little four minute presentation here just telling you about some of the things that we're doing on terrestrial side to, uh, to prepare ourselves for what I would call two big new trends that we see in the space, the space of ITS. The first trend is trend of connectivity. Um, we often talk about connectivity of vehicles. 70% of vehicles will be connected by 2021 based on most research reports that you will see out there. But that's just one element. We see the other element being uh, infrastructure getting connected. So smart infrastructure connected to smart vehicles create the entire new possibility for better ITS. Uh, we believe that, uh, we, and we call it ourselves, digital transportation infrastructure creates an opportunity for providers of the infrastructure to connect much better with travelers, with people in the cars, people uh, on bicycles and bikes, and with a single platform create an opportunity to exchange data. And when you can put all the data on a single platform, then you can have smart analytics run on that platform and inform people that will be affected by certain incidents, by certain closures of the roads and uh, only inform those people that are moving in that particular direction. You have a location awareness and location awareness allows you to be much more intelligent about how you communicate with people that are participating in traffic. 
So a lot of our efforts uh, recently have gone into digital transportation infrastructure. It is fully supportive of European Commission's uh, collaborative ITS directive. And as such, uh, we're very proud of what we have done, particularly with the Finnish Transportation Authority as one of the first examples of how this can work in the real world. So connectivity is one. And uh, the second big one, obviously, is uh, what we call a combination of many advances in, in, um, in let's call it, uh, digital world, one of which is automation, uh, the second one being uh, machine learning, uh, predictive analytics, ability to put many more sensors in vehicles. All of these capabilities combined together are really enablers for the inevitably coming world of automated driving. And for the world of automated driving, we believe we have a very important role to play, and that role is to create the, by far the most precise map for the vehicles. And as you can imagine, the map that is used today for navigation is a map that's intended for humans. The map that we're developing, we call it HD Live Map for automated driving, is really intended for machines in the car to understand. And these maps have to be significantly more precise. They have to be up to 10, 20 centimeters in precision. So obviously way more precise than the maps that you see today, digital maps. But for this, we can absolutely benefit for better GPS signal. But even in the, um, in the absence of better positioning, we still put so much precision in this product and a lot of localization object allowing car companies that with the smart uh, algorithms in the vehicles can better position their cars and keep that position locked for a longer period of time. So HD Live Map is, uh, is something that we really believe will change the automotive industry as uh, we move towards automation and a lot of, lot of effort uh, that the entire industry is putting in is going into creation of these super precise maps. But it's not just about maps, it's about intelligent services on top. And unfortunately, I think the propagation delay that you have with satellite technology would not make satellites really a good effective tool to, uh, to bring connectivity to automated vehicles because you get about five microseconds for every kilometer. Uh, but the, uh, the terrestrial networks, LTE and 5G, and by the way, I don't know if you know, but in 5G, a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer networking is uh, going to be built in, so 5G will allow you to do almost uh, pretty seamless vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. So with Live map, we're also introducing information about what's happening on the road in real time and making that available to all participants in the, in the traffic. And then finally, to finish on top of it all, we do have a, a layer of predictive analytics, making uh, driving cars behave more like humans. So when the car goes to automated mode, they don't drive very mechanically or robotically, let's say, they drive much more like humans would drive. So those are some of the advancements that we're very focused on in the next two to three years. We expect to see the first fully autonomous vehicles or fully automated vehicles by 18, 2019 maybe, uh, and then autonomous vehicles in a few years after that. And we expect and hope to play uh, an important role in that development. So that's my short four minute. Thank you very much. Many thanks to you, Ogi Redzik. You touched upon it uh, at the beginning of your presentation and also a bit later uh, in terms of how space technologies have facilitated uh, the very existence of your company. But maybe you would just say a word or two more about the distinctions between what we can achieve with space technologies and where terrestrial uh, technologies essentially uh, give us what we need. When we look at those developments that you outlined, how far can we get with terrestrial and where do you need that additional augmentation from space technologies? Well, when you look at the map of United States or map of Africa, you will see that while we have terrestrial networks where the urban population is, you certainly have vast parts of the country that are not necessarily covered with mobile networks today. So I view uh, satellite technology even for communications as a great backup and enhancer so that you can continue at least some level of service as you move outside of densely populated areas where we Ultimately, we'll be using terrestrial networks for both communication and with assisted GPS heavily for positioning as well. Uh, and as we move forward, I really hope that the next generation of satellites that uh, we launch in the space will allow us to get into that sub-meter precision uh, without a whole lot of additional equipment on the ground because that will make the technology significantly cheaper, more cost-effective to deploy in regular vehicles and not just for some special purpose vehicles or in defense categories. So, David Combi, perhaps you also would care to weigh in on this, uh, perhaps you also, uh, Mr. Peltimaki, but uh, do I understand then that essentially the, the added value of space technologies is going to be greater coverage, greater precision, and also perhaps something we might call systems resilience uh, backup? Yes. 
Well, <coughs> looking at the, the coverage of GPS today is excellent. Uh, the issue is the performance, the level of performance that is required uh, to for, for the advent of new services. Uh, and this is the reason why I, I insisted on my first presentation, on my presentation, the fact that um, GNSS is evolving, uh, GPS, Galileo, Beidou, uh, GLONASS, we are going into a um, multi-constellation environment with new signals, uh, improved st sig uh, structures of the, of the, st of the signals, uh, improvement of, of, of EGNOS. We also have to uh, think about the design of new uh, GNSS generations. So I think now this is uh, more a matter of performance than a matter of coverage, uh, as far as I uh, understand. And uh, keeping in mind that the combination of GNSS with other sensors uh, might be essential. Mr. Pelter McKeith, perhaps you would like to add to that. And I'd also be interested to know what DG growth can do in order to bring these applications into wider commercial usage. First, I have to rely on my more technically capable colleagues in this podium. I think that I think that uh, whenever we are developing these kind of technologies, I guess that we are looking for the 5G that was mentioned. That of course, I think that in terms of the kind of a take up of a different type of the Internet of Things type of the solutions, where I think that uh, uh, but that's uh, uh, one thing. But of course, I think that uh, whenever we look at kind of a, uh, space technologies, I guess that. Uh, very much uh, what uh, David was saying. I think perhaps it's a question that uh, they are a uh, certain kind of a different type of the technologies to cover the similar type of the things, but I think then it's a question of the, what is the performance, what is kind of the specificities in a different kind of application area that how you can th then combine these kind of things together. But that's perhaps poor lawyer's uh, view of, of this thing. But of course then what we are doing, I think that this uh, very much, I think, whenever we are having the infrastructure in place, and I think it has been, I think, very much of the common uh, European effort now to uh, use a lot of public money to have uh, these uh, satellites up in the uh, orbit. I think, and of course, I think that we are having the great interest now really to kind of use cases. I think make sure that I think that uh, the most kind of uh, uh, Kind of, a, there are opportunities well uh, uh, offered for for all different kind of application areas. Uh, what is it? I think now, uh, perhaps we know, and I think that even those that we don't know yet. And I think that there are a lot of uh, uh, things that I can easily imagine that I think that, that are based on, on kind of satellite technologies as well as as whatever is I think ongoing with the digitalization and based on Internet of Things or whatever name you give it. Both uh, Mr. Kombi and also Mr. Ritzik mentioned the possible applications of these technologies in terms of fixed infrastructure, not only vehicle uses, but also promoting seamlessness in terms of intermodality. Is that uh, a priority for DG Growth? I think that uh, <coughs> for us, uh, I think that uh, these technologies can be applied and I think that there are already the use cases that I think David was uh, referring to what is uh, done in maritime, what is aviation, what is kind of railway and of course I think that uh, to us I think that to be or uh, I think not as such putting certain kind of a priority of what is the application area I guess that for us the more the application areas there are can take a full benefit of uh, these kind of a new technologies, I guess that that's the purpose from, let's say, regulatory or regulator's point of view that I think that we have been, I think there's a public authority together with the member states invested a lot. I think now it's the time to pay back. Mr. Wang, two questions for you in regard to uh, ITS community perceptions, uh, perhaps, you being such a an firm and upstanding member of that ITS community world. I wonder if you would just say a word to us. We focused a lot here on satellite navigation applications. How well does the ITS community understand the poten potential benefits and implications of the other space technologies, for example, in the area of communications and Earth observation? Uh, I think the uh, 
this uh, satellite technology not just uh, used in the position and the route guidance, but uh, we can also use the, this satellite as a, a communication channel, especially in the BDS system can provide the uh, information transfer and uh, in the same time. So uh, and now in China, uh, many uh, companies develop some the new tech uh, equipment uh, can they use uh, this uh, DBS system as uh, communication, but the very short the message is very cheaper. It's not, uh, it's uh, no charge. So I think it's very important. Another thing is that just now you ask uh, for the use of this uh, satellite to monitoring and the management infrastructure. Uh, in China, we have uh, uh, several uh, project. And uh, yeah, yeah. and the application system focus on the road and the bridge uh, infrastructure management. Uh, first one is the uh, the survey and the some uh, monitoring for the uh, road uh, pavement uh, bridge the situation. We can uh, use this uh, technology as a position, and uh, compared with the other detectors. Uh, cameras uh, and uh, lasers and uh, so on, and uh, uh, integrate in the one system. I think it's a very high uh, efficiency to, uh, for the, this uh, uh, monitoring and the, the detector system. Uh, second one is that we also uh, organize the uh, project that use uh, DPS as the monitoring the bridge. You know, in China we have many, many uh, uh, large uh, city uh, bridge. Uh, this uh, bridge is, uh, uh, in sometimes is, uh, uh, his uh, structure is very important. We can uh, use the, this uh, uh, satellite technology uh, monitoring the, the structure change. So I think this is not just used for the root guidance, but the many, many things that can use the te space technology. Thank you very much. One follow-up question, if you would, because you did mention costs. To what degree can satellite technology, space technologies, help bring down the costs of ITS deployment in general? Uh, you know, uh, we can uh, use uh, this uh, technology to uh, improve the efficiency. You know, if efficiency is improved, you will save the money. It's a, but uh, uh, in the beginning of the use of this uh, new technology, especially for the, the DPS, maybe the equipment is uh, not cheap. So uh, in this uh, uh, stage, the government must uh, give some support and make some the policy. And also we uh, support the, some the operators, the transportation companies use this. And the more and the more use and the product of uh, a large quantity, the price is low. And then move the usage to the uh, consumers. This uh, is a way, it's a, it's, a, it's a method to improve. Thank you very much. I do want to give the audience a chance to pose their questions as well. So I'm going to try to peer beyond these spotlights. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Yes, there I have one in the third row. Um, I wonder, we don't have microphones, I guess, out there, so I'm going to come to you with a microphone. Thank you. So Julie and Gracia will kindly be a microphone transporter. There we go. We have a hostess now. Thanks. And do tell yes. us who you are. Yes, uh, Alain Fournier-Sic, I'm a president of uh, AAA Group International. And uh, I have a question for the uh, Chinese party. Uh, and uh, it's uh, about uh, the decision which has been made uh, recently about uh, 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 air transportation between counties. There are many counties in China and uh, that will uh, be a revolution of uh, air transportation and uh, what do you think uh, uh, will be the help of uh, the GNSS system 
uh, to implement uh, this uh, huge uh, uh, airplane transportation between uh, uh, small counties. I, I think there is a, <laughs> okay, there are very good questions, though. Can, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the air transportation area, we have some uh, like dispatching system. It's a use of the dispatching system to improve the air uh, condition, especially in efficiency and some to improve the, uh, the safety. Uh, if you use the GNSS technology in the airplane, you can use the you you can the accuracy your position and uh, inc uh, increase the density of the uh, airplane in the space. So uh, now the Chinese government decide we can test the use the uh, GPS in the airplane. But now most of the airplane use the GPS system. So I think this is very uh, useful for the uh, uh, transportation in the air, in the air. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. Who else has a question? I have one here in the uh, third row. Uh, Tom Stone from Traffic Technology International. Uh, quick question for here. Um, in the, um, with the uh, 5G coming in and the accuracy of, of satellite location, do you still see there as uh, being a, uh, a place for DSRC communications in a connected vehicle environment, or are you going to overtake that? Uh, I will give you my, my personal perspective on this, uh, and it's going to be very short. I think with 5G coming, uh, deployments of DSRC will be very challenged, and it will be challenged in a sense that uh, DSRC deployment on infrastructure side is very costly, and I don't think we have a very good business model that has emerged yet, uh, and that it's obvious about DSRC deployment. So I do believe that the public networks will take its fair share, and with 5G, a lot of delay that was inherently built into the previous mobile technologies will be gone. So, uh, in my personal opinion, I think 5G will um, probably uh, be taking over even vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication over the next 10 to 15 years. Thanks very much. Who else would like to pose a question? Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the very interesting information. And I'm working for the automotive industry, company in Toddenk, about uh, also new technology-wise. But I just uh, really interesting about the new GPS systems. Recently, Japan also launching the new GPS satellite, named the Michibiki. And the uh, automotive industry is always suffering from the different protocol from the each region, from the Japan, Asia, US, and EU. European market. Uh, the, do you know have some uh, the advantage for the EU new GPS system for the accuracy, accuracy, uh, how say accuracy or how should I say some new technologies or also working with uh, different systems in uh, the globally also or the ITS keywords to link it to the new technology? Don't, don't give the mic away yet because we have a horrible echo here on this stage and it is very, very hard to understand you. So may I ask you to please repeat your question slowly if you would and maybe take the microphone a little bit away from your mouth okay. and then let's see if we understand you better. Is it better to understand here? Uh, for the new GPS systems in EU also launching into the last two years, I think, and start for new services. And Japan also launching a new GPS satellite, also start service in maybe 2018. And uh, is that a significant difference for the technology base or also future global ITS? Do you have any collaboration with those kind of different uh, areas, Japan, US, and uh, Europe? Let me see if anybody understood it well enough to comment. Um, differences between e EU and US.
I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure to, to have clearly understood, understood your question. Uh, does it deal with the cooperation between uh, Japan and US or? Yes, for the new generation, for the GPS satellite uh, signals or protocol, or also from the some same target from the accuracy from the GPS signal for the ITS. Um, sorry, I don't think I have any element on that. Or any technology differentiation between the new European satellite GPS systems, also from the other satellite systems. Any good advantage for technologies? I think the question does concern differentiation between the different uh, satellite systems, EU, Japanese, US. That's how I understood it. Could you nod if that's Yes, correct. Yes. yes, okay. We have terrible sound up here, I'm sorry. Uh, so what are the major difference between Japan system and European system? Uh, I, uh, I can mention the fact that, uh, but on, under the control of the European Commission, that <laughs> um, there are some uh, agreements of cooperation between the European Union and, uh, uh, and uh, other countries uh, developing GNSS systems. Um, I cannot go into the detail of uh, an agreement between Japan and the European Union, or uh, the, but um, sure that uh, the, the European Union, as far as it can, uh, promote um, cooperation between the Genesis systems. I don't know if. Uh, uh. I don't know exactly kind of a, if you were asking whether these kind of a different protocols in different systems are really I think interoperable, but I think I can assure that of course we are having kind of a very intensive kind of collaboration with all kind of a, those uh, countries in the world who are having kind of a, uh, their own uh, satellite systems. So that I think that it's kind of a policy dialogues, and of course we try to be very practical and I think really to address these issues. And I think that. Uh, like David was saying, that I think the interoperability is one thing between Galileo and, and GPS. Of course, I think that this is kind of a goal that I think we are having as much as possible, the kind of possibility to use these satellites together in a kind of a most flexible way. Thank you very much. The microphone seems to be going up here to the right, but I know there's a question over here too, so we'll come back to you in just a moment. Go ahead, Go ahead please. Um, Hello, Fiametta Diani from the European GNSS Agency. Just wanted to complement uh, what has been said. So for what uh, uh, Galileo and the new GNSS system can bring uh, for ITS, uh, there are many new features, in fact. In, you know, in urban environments, uh, as more many satellites you get, uh, as better is uh, your performances. Uh, and all the systems cooperate together to this. Uh, on top, Galileo will bring some differentiators uh, as uh, authentication on the signal, as it has been mentioned, that it is very important in uh, many new ITS, uh, such as mobility as a service. And uh, if you want to discover more, we have uh, application village of Galileo in the exhibition, and uh, you can experience and see some uh, in the field uh, application. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for augmenting our answer there. And uh, I will take one last question up here on, in the middle on the aisle. Uh, good afternoon, Hamilton Party, ITS European Congress in Glasgow 2016. A, a question really, these satellite systems have been around for a long time and are quite mature. 
where does our ITS community see the lowering the costs or making better use of the communications we have and more using the Earth observations from space to make our ITS systems better? Who would like to answer that? Mr. Wang? I think the, the space technology is a, is a long history, you just said. Uh, now, uh, these uh, satellite uh, systems can be used by many, many aspects, the transportation, uh, uh, management, uh, some uh, culture, uh, angry culture, and, uh, and, and many, many. So I think the more users, more cheaper. So now for IT, for ITS uh, aspect, we don't think this uh, the, 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 this system is uh, expensive. I think it's uh, cheaper, especially uh, you can buy the the uh, the, the, the equipment. Uh, based on the, the GPS, the GNS, they're very cheaper, especially in China, it's also very cheaper. So, it, I think it is a, no problem. I can use the many, many ITS application areas, just uh, for the automotive car, driverless car, uh, monitoring, uh, and, uh, and, and so on, and the dispatching system, many. So, I think it's a uh, it's uh, not, uh, not uh, expensive. i just add to that that I think for positioning, uh, we will continue to use satellites, obviously. But for uh, survey, uh, we, will, we still have these commercial agreements and not necessarily with governmental satellites, but with, uh, with companies like Digital Globe, I think that will remain. But for majority of urban dense areas, aerial survey, I think, has already taken over where you have a lot much better imagery, get much better at creating 3D models of the cities, which is what we do in mapping. And I do view that uh, uh, aerial will, in many dense areas, or if already has, taken over for satellite surveying and satellite imagery to create the models of the future cities in abstract mode. Thank you very, very much. Before we close this session, I'm just going to look over to our organizers uh, to ask whether is there any housekeeping hint that needs to be given, or uh, do we just say thanks and goodbye? then that's what I'll do. Many, many thanks to all of our panelists uh, for these very interesting uh, re remarks and uh, interaction. And thanks to you as well for your attention and your participation. And I look forward to seeing everybody on Friday at uh, plenary session number three. And until then, I wish you a wonderful time in Bordeaux. Bye-bye.